Hello and welcome to this episode of Nothing Ventured with me, Ari Shah. Today I am talking to Kelvin Au in the studio with me. Uh, today we talk about thematic investing, what it means to be thematic versus a generalist, his journey from accelerators back into VC, and what founders should be thinking about when they launch their product. The major thing that we talk about today, which is top of everyone's mind, is the recent news of SVB's failure in the US and its acquisition in the UK by HSBC, and what that means for how founders should think about concentration risk, both with their banks and beyond. This is a great episode. You're not going to want to miss it. Hello and welcome to this episode of Nothing Ventured with me, Ari Shah. Today in the studio with me, I am super excited to have Kelvin Al. Kelvin is partner at Cell Capital, a thematically focused fund investing from seed to series A. If you want to learn more about Kelvin's background and Cell Capital, check out our primer that we released a couple of days ago. It's super interesting and I hope you're going to enjoy the rest of this episode where we speak to Kelvin. Kelvin, great to have you here in the studio with me. Glad to be here. Thank you. Amazing. So we're recording this a few days after a pretty sizable event in the ecosystem. I'm talking, of course, of the second largest bank collapse uh, in history, uh, that being SVB. Uh, so let's talk about that for, for a few minutes. Um, how big an event do you think this was for the ecosystem? And um, is this a reset for kind of Neo and challenger banks? How, how should people be thinking about this uh, in, in broader terms? It's been a stressful weekend for all, <laughs> sure, I think, sure. uh, to say the least. <clears throat> of course, it's a big deal. Uh, I think uh, I, I wouldn't quite call it as a reset because I think uh, the reset probably happened quite some months ago, mm. uh, if not uh, through COVID. Um, I would say that uh, this is a reminder that, you know, people can react and behave ir irrationally because I, I really do believe that uh, in a perfect or ideal optimal context where people uh, think rationally this probably would not have happened yeah in terms of a classic bank run but of course you know in in, in light of recent events uh, in light of how the markets are doing in, in in light of inflation and interest rate rises um <clears throat> people have to protect themselves and that's exactly what happened yeah it was it was more a case of don't want to be the last man standing than it was i, I guess necessarily uh, an event that was driven by, you know, certain fear of a collapse. It, it was, you know, um, something that kind of sparked off on Twitter and then gained momentum uh, and, and ultimately led to, to the bank's collapse. And obviously, ultimately, the US and the UK governments have, have taken quite significant strides, right? So we've had, obviously, in the UK, HSBC uh, purchase SVB for, 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 for a pound, which is a pretty damn good deal. You know, I think it was printing 88 million of profit uh, mm -hmm. in, in the previous year, uh, had a pretty solid balance sheet, but, you know, was not um, w was not risk free from from the events that happened in the US. In the US, of course, the FDIC has uh, guaranteed depositors, which which has made them whole. I think one thing, it, it, you know, it, it, it's really important uh, for people to understand <laughs> was these weren't government bank bailouts. They protected depositors, but actually they've wiped out the shareholders and, 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 and the management in these banks. Right. And just take could you take a second and explain for listeners, the difference between those two effects and, and, and essentially what that then means? Yes, a full public slash government bail bailout means taxpayers' money are being used in order to essentially preserve uh, both the operational side of the business uh, within the bank, but also a shareholder value. Uh, in these cases, thankfully, uh, it's not a bailout in the sense that uh, the FDIC or the UK government is really just making whole uh, for deposit's sake um, as, as, as a de de deposit guarantee. Um, so as a shareholder uh, in, in the bank, in the business, whether it's a private or public uh, shareholder, uh, you actually lose out. But as a depositor, uh, your deposits are being guaranteed. And I think that's a major difference uh, looking back at uh, 2008, 2009, when banks, yes, literally, they were being bailed out. Everybody's money, including taxpayers' money, uh, were being used to bail out those banks because basically it was a domino. 
Yeah, there was a there was there was the assumption that you know these banks were too big to fail and it would lead to effectively contagion throughout the ecosystem correct, or throughout correct. the economy as a whole. One one of the things that I've been really conscious about with this whole SVB situation was you know something that I think a lot of founders actually don't necessarily think about in their own businesses, let alone. Uh, when they're thinking about like a banking partner was how concentrated <coughs> SVB's uh, client base was, right? Which ultimately was was a big part of the problem and why HBS, HSBC as an example that's brought out the U UK arm should have less of an issue because obviously HSBC has multiple um, uh, streams of client base, you know, from, from corporate and, uh, you know, large cap all the way through to kind of individual, you know, um, uh, depositors. So, uh, you know, h how should businesses be thinking about, you know, that concentration risk or that, that question of concentration risk, not only in terms of their, their banking provider, but also in terms of their businesses? Yeah, you know, uh, hind hindsight's a, a, <laughs> an amazing thing, right? Um, before, uh, just, just before, you know, this weekend, uh, not many investors or even founders, even tier one uh, companies, have thought about having multiple banking relationships. And of course, now everybody's open multiple bank accounts. And you know, going back to your question, neo banks and traditional high street banks definitely benefit uh, mm. from this. And I'm really glad that XSBC has kind of has the guts uh, to, to do this, um, to take on the, the client base. Um, I think, you know, from a startup standpoint, uh, concentration is, is always a big, big risk. Um, let's just talk about commercial slash revenues. As you very well know, let's just say, you know, you're a SaaS company. Of course, it's better to have 10 relatively diverse uh, clients than having all revenues generated through one or two clients, right? Um, so I think the concept is not new. Um, and I think uh, from a commercial slash operational standpoint, um, running a business is not new. But when you're looking at middle or back office operations, which may have a similar impact on the business. Um, I think what happened over the last few days is definitely a great reminder that yes, we need to diversify our suppliers. Mm. Let's just say, you know, going back to the a manufacturing kind of example, of course, you need to have a diversified set of potential manufacturers, not just in a region, China or Asia, but also across the globe as well, uh, yeah. just to essentially diversify from political risk, potentially. Yeah, I mean, this is something I saw a lot working in kind of emerging economies. We would always have multiple suppliers, you know, um, because you never knew if there was going to be a failure to, 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 to meet demand on one side or as you say, political or geographical risk. I mean, obviously, you know, I was operating at the time in Southeast Asia, Australasia. You know, we had uh, the impact of typhoons, of, of tsunamis, of all sorts of things. In fact, at one stage, we had obviously the, uh, you know, nuclear meltdown in, in, in Japan. Uh, obviously, SVB didn't have a nuclear yes. meltdown. It had a meltdown of, of some sorts. How, how do you think this is going to impact neo or challenger banks do, do you think that there is a risk of further failures i know you have a slightly different view to a lot of the the stuff that is being trotted out on twitter these days i'm slightly more optimistic i personally do believe that svb and perhaps a couple other banks are outliers uh, i do believe that the more traditional high street banks and even neo banks um, are more diversified in terms of uh, how they operate. I think SVB is is unfortunate in the sense that, you know, it, again, it's the perfect storm, mm. right, <clears throat> of uh, high inflation, interest rate rises. They probably made a less than optimal call in terms of <laughs> plowing a bunch of money in 10-year uh, MBSs. Um, but um, I do believe that uh, the rest of the industry, hopefully, uh, will be um, away from this event. Mm. Uh, although there could be contagion risk. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, as a CFO, you know, and I and working with a number of CFOs through through kind of my my business, obviously the weekend was pretty frantic. You know, there's a lot of emails going out to JP Morgan mm -hmm. uh, and HSBC and various others trying to get, you know, bank accounts opened up. And I think, you know, what we're going to see is a little bit of diversification in terms of the banking providers. But also, I think people have to remember that, 
it is very difficult to manage, you know, multiple relations, multiple bank accounts when you are a small, relatively small startup or, or yes. scale up. You know, there, there, there have been, you know, suggestions as an example that uh, founders in the US should keep their, you know, let's say you've got two and a half million on deposit, you need to be working with 10 different banks in order to ensure, you know, make sure that mm -hmm. your, your deposits are insured. And of course there are sweep accounts, all sorts of things, but actually that's a huge amount of overhead uh, to try and carry. I guess this is something that it's, it's a bit of wait and see. Obviously the dust is still settling. We're still seeing um, what second, third order mm -hmm. uh, effects might come out of this. Um, I, I, I definitely think, you know, we should applaud all the actors, you know, whether it's Codec here in the US, uh, in the UK, rather FDIC in, in the US and all the people that kind of banded together. One thing I'd probably add is that, you know, you, you mentioned that there was, there was a perfect storm. I, part of that perfect storm with SVB was not only do you have uh, ventures, so, so you know, uh, startups and scale-ups, banking with them, you had actually people with their own personal money uh, with bank who've Correct. come out of the ecosystem and you yes. also had VCs uh, with their funds <clears throat> deployed in the ecosystem. So, yeah. you know, across across all of these sort of different uh client bases people are going to be asking questions and people are going to want more assurance that you know that the, their cash is secured so def definitely one to watch i would say yes. um so look let's move on talk a bit more about some some other interesting stuff because i've had my fill of svb over the last few days for sure mm -hmm. so you were head of ventures at founders factory which you talked about a little bit on on the primary ex episode so ex accelerators are very very different animals to <coughs> funds so but could you talk me through what you have taken from that experience of the Founders Factory model of accelerators in general and, and transferred into how you're operating at Cell Capital? Sure. I think one of the most <clears throat> compelling and interesting um, value or propositions that Founders Factory and perhaps other kind of early stage accelerator programs are offering to the market is, is the support, right? And when I say support, it's not just you know, high level advice from a bank of mentors or venture partners uh, where you as a founder may only spend an hour a month with mm. uh, in order to glean the advice. Um, when I say support is actually really sitting down with you on, on the same side of the table, working through execution and operational issues. And I think my experience at Founders Factory has been amazing in the sense that, you know, we've been working with 150, 200 portfolio companies through several years, um, I was there um, um, across the globe in terms of really crafting um, the propositions for these companies across a number of, dis a number of disciplines, right? I was running um, the investment team. So obviously one of my key remits is to make sure that there is a right uh, fundraising and investment narrative going out to the market, as well as investment materials that's required in order to raise a successful round. I, I remember going through several turns of a, <laughs> of a financial model with one yes. of my clients with you at the time. Yeah. It, uh, and and it, was, it was actually very impressive kind of how much detail, especially given that, as you say, you're working across 200, you know, portfolio companies, <clears throat> the level of detail that you guys would go into in terms of, you know, questioning and challenging some of the, some of the assumptions. In yes. There. Yes. Let's, let's put it this way. Sleep was not a priority <laughs> back then uh, when you're working with so many companies, but, but, you know, in all seriousness, I think <clears throat> this is what the ecosystem really requires, especially when you're operating in early, in early stage venture anywhere up to series A. I, I do believe that, you know, the founders and the team would really require some, some hands-on um, advice and support. Yeah. yeah. And, and how have you transferred that to sell capital? What, what are the elements of that kind of model that you've taken uh, into the work that you're doing at sell capital? Now? Sure. One thing that we didn't mention about Founders Factory uh, was that we worked with uh, corporate partners yeah. uh, for each of the verticals of investing. Mm. Um, and I do believe that by working with domain experts within a field, within a space, it's beneficial, mm -hmm. um, as well as providing the operational support. So at Cell Capital, what I was trying to do is essentially combine the two, but to the extent where we can still scale. Mm -hmm. Because let, let's put it this way, you know, when you're a people business, it's not scalable. Mm. When you have 200 companies in your portfolio, it's not scalable yeah. in terms of, you know, spending immense time uh, with the portfolio founders. Um, <clears throat> but at Cell Capital, what we're trying to do here is to follow um, the, the stance and the proposition where thesis-driven investing um, is important. Mm -hmm. Thematically, being th thematically focused uh, does add value. Mm -hmm. 
and it does come across to the founders and the founding teams that you know what you're talking about within that space. Um, but we're also providing a relatively sizable investment, right? As opposed to running streams of programs where you may receive uh, avenues or hours of support uh, in time from experts and professionals. But in terms of the cash in bank, it's not, it, it's not being replenished. It doesn't move the dial, yeah. Um, and, and, and so I think the learning is that, you know, as much as uh, founders do appreciate your time, um, I think cash is still king. Yeah, I, I, I think my take on accelerators has always been, and maybe this is because I've just had more experience, I guess, working and operating. It's very difficult as a founder to go into an accelerator, especially one that has a relatively cookie cutter approach. And I'm not suggesting that Founders Factory has this at all, but certainly there are plenty of other accelerators out there that just sort of run you through a program. But the reality is, as an example, as a non-technical founder, the most essential support that I needed would have been around, uh, you know, getting the right CTO in place, having the right tech uh, and product teams in place, etc. And I would have wanted, you know, 100% of the time that the accelerator spent with me on focus on on on, on that thing. And I, I haven't been, mm -hmm. to be clear, I haven't been through an accelerator with this particular business. But you know, if they are providing me marketing support or introductions to investors, that's less valuable to me because I already have an understanding of marketing and I already have relationships with investors. And I think it can be very difficult as a founder to get to get the value that you require rather than the value that the accelerator wants to provide you, right? And to your point, you know, when you have 200 uh, business in, 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 in the portfolio, providing very precise, specific advice and, and uh, direction around the things that are important to, to, to the founder, becomes harder and harder and as you say becomes harder to scale because you know if you need to keep bringing in specialists from certain areas without the balance sheet to be able to do that then that that becomes untenable yeah. right you know as and you know to, to be fair you know as, as, as much as you uh, can give up your sleep you know there's only 24 hours in a day um, and and obviously you know if you need to work with numerous founders on crafting the deck materials, preparing the data room together, uh, you know, these 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 take time. Yeah. Right? And I think scalability is definitely a key thing. Yeah. Well, for anyone out there who's working on uh, finding another three days in the week, uh, Kelvin's your man. <laughs> um, so let, look, you, you touched on it just now, but let's let's talk about it in a bit more detail, right? So why thematic versus general? Because there, there are a lot of generalist funds out there today, and you and I have talked about this a little bit in the past. What value does a thematic fund provide over a generalist fund? And then why these specific uh, verticals that, that Cell Capital has gone into? Sure. I think the learning and the observations um, that I've had in the last few years have been, uh, if we just look at both sides of the ecosystem, right? You have founders and then you have investors, but investors from a limited partners standpoint. So venture capital funds, investors, LPs. When we speak to founder side of things, uh, they actually require the investors to have deep knowledge in terms of what they do, right? The ideal scenario would be you provide a capital, but you also provide a fantastic network of connections, whether uh, those being potential customers or potential investors who like the founder's propositions. The famous value add in venture. The value add um, from a connection standpoint, and indeed, ideally, operational support if you're an early stage business. Mm. So that's on the founder side. And then from the LP side, we are seeing increasingly uh, the number of LPs who actually just want to invest in things that resonate with them, right? And traditionally is, you know, if you're raising a generalist fund, what we call a blind pool fund in generalist sectors, so across a number of different sectors, um, the LPs investing in fund, they deploy the capital into the fund, and they wouldn't know what you're going to invest in, mm. what sectors, what companies, what precise opportunities. And and for our listeners, most LPs, I think this is one of the things that people don't necessarily get, particularly about venture. LPs aren't involved in the decision making process around what no. is then funded. So therefore, they are reliant on the GPs, the general partners, and the investment committees to make those decisions. Right. Correct. And and that's the traditional manner how uh, the private equity and venture, venture capital ecosystem have worked. And that's fine, you know, there's still a big set of LPs 
who operate this way because they just want to diversify risk. They are an asset allocator. Yeah. Right. And, and sorry <laughs> again for our listeners. When you talk about an asset allocator, they you know they, they will have a pool of funds and they decide that you know twenty percent will go into real estate, ten percent might go into private equity, five percent into venture capital, balance in listed e equities, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So all they're doing is managing their portfolio and deploying. They're not interested in where it gets deployed. They just want to make sure it's deployed into the right asset class. Correct. Yeah. Um, but there are an increasing number of LPs who function and think about it differently. Uh, for example second generation family offices mm. where they may have the resource, they may have the mindset of taking a risk and investing in technology ventures, right? Whether directly or indirectly. And we've been seeing many more of these LPs coming to the fore in the sense that um, they may have an, an existing family business or a core business where they actually want to invest in the early stage venture ecosystem uh, in companies which can potentially help their business um, or who could build their sector um, together as well. Um, so in light of that, we at Cell, what we're trying to do is to marry these things up. Um, essentially, we as an investment firm, as investors in early stage ventures, we can bring, we can essentially raise capital from specific set of LPs who care about certain themes and spaces and verticals there may or may not be synergies, but at least uh, those are the areas that resonate with them. Um, but also, by raising capital from those LPs, we can invest in companies and propositions that resonate with the LPs, right? And indeed, because we're raising money from these sets of LPs, uh, we're building a good network uh, within specific spaces and, and domains where we can then hopefully be helpful uh, to the potential founders. So, so when you talk about being a thematically focused um, uh, fund, does that mean that every partner brings a specific sector expertise? So obviously you have the LPs who, who have uh, a focus of, of where they want to deploy. Does that mean, you know, you talked about the ability to scale people. Again, does, do you not get caught a little bit into that trap whereby for every new fund or new vertical or new theme that you you start investing in you're going to have to bring in more people or or how do you think about that yes and of course there's a threshold right you know i think yeah. you know if we are raising uh uh each fund of each fund of size five million dollars mm. that's not scalable yeah um and and so there's always a uh, a minimum threshold that we look at um and of course with fund ones Focusing on seed and Series A, you don't need a massive fund. Mm -hmm. yeah. To be honest, I think anybody raising um, a, a very big fund for seed investing are, are just greedy by nature. Um, I actually don't think you need a massive fund to be very successful in seed. Um, but no, uh, you're right. Um, so, you know, I think we're being very careful in terms of uh, the strategy that we're picking, um, but also uh, only looking at spaces um, where there's investor appetite. Right. Okay. So it's 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 driven by the LPs rather than necessarily your kind of uh, uh, predic predication towards any particular sector. So let's talk about those sectors for a second, right? Because you you are still even as a thematic investor, you are investing across quite a broad range, right? Mm -hmm. So we've had, uh, you know, we talked about agri food. Um, you know, in the primer, we talked about. Um, uh, uh, sustainability and impact we talked about national security mm -hmm. so let's talk about national security because you mentioned there's a lot to talk about there uh in in the primer so let, using that as an example you know why is that such an important space right now and how are you developing as as cell capital the bandwidth and the ability to to navigate that space because it seems to me a obviously a very very important space right national security we're talking you know in in march of uh, 2023 we still have a war happening in in russia and ukraine mm -hmm. uh, or in ukraine between russia and ukraine uh, and potential other um you know uh, potential for other sort of uh, issues around national security whether that's food security whether that's borders you know we're, we're in the uk where obviously uh, there's a lot of talk about migrant uh, migrant boats crossing the challenge uh, channel how how are you building up that muscle uh, muscle strength and um, you know understanding of the sector, and where are you deploying in that sector? What are the interesting parts of national security that that Cell Capital is looking at? Yes, um, 
if I just take a step back with each of the strategy, you know, as I said, we are very focused um, uh, both thematically and domain expertise uh, standpoint. Um, and especially with national security, we've been very fortunate um, to have essentially um, former special forces um, people um, to be in a team um, who have been able to help us to get into any of the agencies, any of the defense departments uh, within the UK and all of his allies, including the, including the US. Um, uh, they can just pick up the phone and, and we can relatively easily get to the right stakeholder for mm -hmm. any of the startups that we invest in. Um, and I think that is indeed, you know, the, the unfair advantage yep. value add that, that, that we bring. And this happens across each of our investment strategies. Okay. And for, for the national security strategies, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting one because, you know, I still remember the day uh, when we were initially ideating around this uh, national security fund. Um, and that was in January 22, uh, before the Ukraine war happened. Mm. Um, we went around, spoke to a number of different uh, LPs, investors. Uh, there were quite a lot of, quite a lot of interest. Uh, we went round to the founder ecosystem, spotted a number of an amazing plethora of companies, uh, in, ranging from cybersecurity to drones, um, to logistics, um, to enterprise software, uh, which were really interesting from a national security standpoint. Um, so we know that there was something there, right? Um, so you had invest appetite, but you also had actually businesses that were, yeah. were building. And this, this was space. all before the Ukraine war. Yeah, sure. Um, and of course, once the war broke out, everybody wants in. And, and, and so, you know, since, since then, we've uh, invested in six companies. Um, we are still fundraising at the moment. Um, we are hopeful and confident that we'll be able to um, get a decent sized fund um, over the next six months. Um, but in terms of the appetite um, and the spaces, it's, it's been interesting to see the, the different uh, components within the national security industry. So obviously, cyber cyber warfare is is has always been a key component. Um, but uh, the, some of the companies that we have seen um, around predictive intelligence mm. and surveillance have been immense, and it's been so interesting. Where you know, I still remember uh, meeting uh, one of the startups in central London, location not to be named, uh, in central London, where of course you know you can't bring any of your digital devices into the meeting room. Um, due to confidentiality and um, and security uh, issues, um, and everything that we were talking about in that meeting room uh, are basically things that you watch in movies. Yeah, so you're, thought, you're in a <laughs> you're in a skiff or whatever they call them, yes. basically locked down and uh, yes. having having very very detailed conversations about. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and and, and you know. Um, is is interesting to me because you know I love these types of movies and 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 episodes, um, but it's just baffling that it of course it happens in real life, mm. um, and of course majority of the population would not be listening or have privilege to 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 hear these uh, things that are happening or these strategies or these initiatives happening, uh, whether you're talking about within government or outside privately, um, but there are a ton of tech innovation just tackling this space. And which which makes it really exciting, right? For 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 this strategy, um, and maybe the last thing that I just want to mention about this is uh, we only invest in propositions that have a dual use purpose, mm -hmm. so not yep. just for defense use cases, but also for commercial, because as you know, defense, perhaps similarly like the NHS, massively long sales cycle. Uh, there are many hoops and stakeholders you have to go through. Thankfully, we have people inside who can help, but still, is 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 a beast to penetrate, and so we do rely on the commercial side of these startups uh, to generate uh, revenue sooner or to have seen product market fit uh, sooner, so that you know it's a credible venture scale business. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, and and I think that's a lesson that anyone operating in in heavily sort of government influence fields <coughs> need to be very conscious of, you know. B2B enterprise is, you know, t typically has sort of six, nine, even 12 month uh, timescales uh, to get to contracts, etc. Presumably with government that can be, you know, that can be even twofold, you know, up to a couple mm -hmm. of years. 
um, because of, of the critical nature of the services or, or, the, or the, um, you know, the product that's being supplied. Um, just moving away slightly now. So you've been an operator. You've been, you know, the coal face of an accelerator. You've been uh, a VC, obviously, uh, you know, at, at, at Draper, at, at Molten, as it were, and now at Cell Capital. What, what are the things from at a personal level that you've taken from each of those roles, if I can put it that way, uh, each of those s similar but different kind of uh, viewpoints of working in the early stage ecosystem and how have you brought them together? What, what, what for you gives you the most energy out of all of that? You have to love what you do <laughs> because I think within this space, whether you're a founder operator um, or a VC, uh, you work hard, of course, uh, and on many occasions, lots are at risk mm. right whether you're talking about your bank account dwindling uh, resources professional life personal life family especially if you have uh, family members to to look after um, all of these things matter and i think the only thing that would pull you through not to be generic for the sake of but i do believe in this is you need to be really passionate about what you do mm. if it's about money that's that's fine, but you can probably earn more money elsewhere. Um, if it's about uh, having fun, fine too, but you can probably have more fun doing something else. Um, I think you need to be very clear internally within your own mind that you know this is your calling, almost, almost um, to, to, to not use a spiritual term, but it does need to be kind of like a calling uh, for this passion to really you know, igniting you. Otherwise, you know, when let's say, you know, the weekend just passed, um, ninety percent of your deposits in SVB could be at risk. Yeah. You might you might be stressed out, completely stressed out. But you know, if you're really in love with what you do, you will find a solution. And I think this is something that I've learned um both as a founder but also having worked with so many founders at Founders Factory and uh, and and Cell is <coughs> being passionate about what you do you prioritize solutions not problems uh, problems are there they are factual statements but inside you you always be coming up with solutions and i think that's that's where the best founders and operators come from yeah i i actually you know just as you were saying that i was thinking about some of the stuff that i was seeing over the weekend uh, and some of the stuff i i uh, did myself and once once people realized that there was an issue with SVB, it became less about, you know, hand flailing and, 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 you know, calling out SVB for having, you know, somehow or the other been uh, acted uh, in, in the wrong way. And it was just about, okay, what do we do now? How do we actually Correct. resolve this? You know, one of the things that, that I did alongside a, a, a couple of other people, I, you know, put together a resources list. Uh, it had on it, you know, service providers, <laughs> it had new banks, it had lend, you know, we, we, we got together about 10 uh, different lenders, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who gave us various sort of types of terms, family offices, debt providers, working working capital providers, which, you know, we were happy to share with founders. As it turns out, we didn't need to because everyone was made, has been made whole. Uh, but, you know, the reality is that as an ecosystem, I think I 100% agree. And we, we saw this during the pandemic as well. People tend to rally together to find the solution rather than focusing on you know on on the problem itself obviously the problem had an impact on people and obviously you know it was all happening over the weekend which made it even worse because you know you mm -hmm. can't get in touch with necessarily the right people but um you know i think i i, I think i'd fully agree you, you've got to if you're working as a startup founder as a vc or, or anywhere else within the ecosystem you you need to be able to cope with that mentality of having um you know having to find solutions which you would never have had to have thought you know to have found in the past right there Certainly. will be problems every single step of the journey and if you're not up for the challenge of solving those problems you're not going to make it through because ultimately so much about both find, founding a business but also investing in a business is is navigating those challenges and that's you know you we, it's actually quite a good way of round, rounding this off right as a founder you, you have a problem you look for solutions as a vc you hope to be able to provide solutions to, to some of those problems or well, that's how you can be most mm -hmm. value additive to 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 the ventures within your portfolio um and and it sounds really you know it sounds very trite you know follow your passion but it isn't actually about following your passion it's about being passionate about what you're doing even if it isn't 
necessarily the passion that you would have chosen. If you're not passionate about what you're doing, you'll have mediocre outcomes uh, at, at, at best. I agree. Um, and just to round off the podcast, like obviously, you know, this is nothing ventured. Um, I founded this podcast uh, on the back of, you know, a lot of thoughts that I'd had around people backing themselves, putting their foot, you know, that best foot forward, taking that first step, doing stuff uh, and launching into the unknown. What, what is your kind of advice, uh, be it to founders, be it to VCs right now, um, you know, because the landscape has changed quite considerably, notwithstanding what's happened at SVB over the last few days. Um, you know, whereby capital is becoming slightly ha harder to, to, to find either as a founder or as a VC, right? LPs have been pulling back, people are rebalancing, uh, people are, are, are naturally more cautious, especially in a, you know, rising interest rate environment, they, they can also find, you know, um, better, faster returns out there. Mm -hmm. What would your advice be um, to, to founders or VCs, you know, getting going or, or raising their next round or raising their next fund uh, today? I think, you know, going back to your passion point, right? Um, I think if you're passionate about something, you will be very resourceful. Um, I think, you know, from my perspective, uh, if you're a founder, I would really advise you to spend some time thinking about what's right uh, if you are to fundraise. Venture capital might not be the right means, right? You know, there's, there's banks where you can indeed uh, get facility or credit lines. Um, and of course... There are angels, there are family offices, there are feces indeed. Um, but feces and there's bootstrapping as well. Indeed, um, yeah. for, for sure. So so I think, you know, as much as you like reading TechCrunch, um, that only represents 0.01% of what happens within the uh, startup ecosystem. So I think um, I would really kind of encourage founders to, to think about whether feces is the right route because, you know, you're almost... Uh, going down a completely different trajectory. Uh, you're choosing a different life if you're raising VC money. Um, and indeed, you know, if you're a VC raising a fund uh, as an emerging manager, uh, likewise, you know, they're, let's be pragmatic. Of course, everybody wants to raise from, let's say, the biggest institutions, EIF, BBB, any of those guys, um, because they write the biggest check and they are very helpful, they're very professional. But be pragmatic, you know, you might not need to raise $100 million uh, in the first fund. It can be less. It can be quicker if you raise from other potential investors, right? Um, and again, just throwing back uh, the former operator founder hat, it, it, if it's about survival, uh, you will do what it takes uh, to, to raise. So, you know, it doesn't have to be $100 million. It doesn't have to be EIF. Uh, it can be an, another alternative, right? Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And and I think just as you're saying that I was sort of laughing on the side purely because having, you know, started building a, a product, raised some angel capital, gone out to VC, not been able to raise from venture, now bootstrapping all of those stories, you know, uh, that I have um, and, and my experiences rather than stories rather, uh, you know, completely resonate with what you've just said. The reality is that, you know, venture became... I think the goal almost for a lot of founders as opposed to a means to an end, right? So venture is a tool or venture funding is a tool to get to that outcome. It isn't the goal itself. And I think a lot of founders have been caught a little bit unaware as to what taking VC funding means, right? And and you mentioned it, it, it drives you towards certain outcomes. It drives you, it actually possibly increases your risk of failure, uh, uh, of business failure, I should say, uh, because you are being pushed down a path of high growth, high scale, very rapidly. Uh, whereas if you're bootstrapping or if you raise small amounts of capital or you take other, you know, uh, other types of funding, you maybe don't have that same dynamic where you're being pushed down that, um, pushed down that path of, of, of hyper growth, right? Um, so yeah, I, and, I, and I, it's I, a very personal decision. Ab absolutely, like, yeah. yeah. Different absolutely. circumstances. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I, I, again, you know, as a slightly older founder myself, you know, I'm, I'm in my mid forties at the moment. Actually, you know, do I want to give up, uh, you know, substantial portions of my life, my time with my 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 wife, my kids? Maybe not. 
maybe yes. And, mm-hmm. and that is, as you say, a hugely personal decision. And I think requires you to have a re- really strong support system around you because mm-hmm. if you try and do it on your own and you don't bring those that are around you with you, uh, you're almost certainly gonna- It's have, a lonely journey. It is a, a lonely very lonely journey. journey for sure. Kelvin, it's been absolutely awesome having you here in the studio with me today. For our listeners, uh, if they wanna look for you online, where's the best place for you for them to find you? Are you on LinkedIn, Twitter, where, where, where are you? Yes, re- reach out to me on LinkedIn. Amazing. Kelvin, thank you so much. Thank you.